everybody. Welcome to our sales progression module. I'm here with Stephen Donahue from Emerson Solicitors today, who's a local solicitor that I know well in our area. And I thought it'd be a really good opportunity to ask the solicitor the questions about sales conveyancing and sales progression that we as agents really ought to understand. So hello and welcome. <laughs> So tell us a bit about yourself, yeah, right. Stephen. So what's your, what do you do? Tell me, tell me your job role and how long have you been in the industry? So I've been conveyancing for about 10 years uh, at Emerson's for eight. Mm -hmm. Started here, I think it was just me and, well, it was me and assistant actually. And uh, we've gone to a fairly decent sized apartment now. It's about, oh, uh, about 10 or so of us. Uh, we do. Uh, quite a considerable more work than we used to and uh, yeah it's, 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 it's busy. Um, and I think it's, it's fair to say you're, the, you're a, the, a company that really prides itself on on the quality offering that it um, offers to, to you. Yeah I mean we're not we're not we're not pricing ourselves as like you know the cheapest guys or, or anything else we, we know our market you know we're, we're here we're offering a service we're offering an individual service we want to be you know a local solicitor, effectively, someone you can just pick up the phone to have a chat with, exchange emails with, or pop into the office. We're, yeah, we're not, a, we're not a factory style operation. Yeah. We're just, you know, normal and think, people. And I think one of the things that I often find when I talk to agents about recommending solicitors is they always, they always worry about price, and it's the same problem we've got as estate agents, isn't it? We're, we're too worried and bothered about being cheapest. But I suppose my first question to you is: You'll always. What does it what does it matter how much people pay for conveyancing? Well, it, it's true to an extent. I mean, at the end of the day, you will always find anything in life. You'll always find someone who do the job cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, you'll always get someone. I mean, we get in our rooms all the time. So and so up the road, we'll, we'll do it for fifty quid less. Fine. Mm -hmm. Off up the road you go. Uh, maybe it's, you know, uh, maybe you're not the client for us. We're we're quite happy with you know. We know what the job entails. We know what it's worth, and we know how much work's involved in price. For that reason, we don't we don't haggle on price because we take pride in like the service we're offering. We're not here looking to be you know the cheapest, not in, you know looking to get the most work through the door or anything like that. We just we, we know our market. We know the sort of clients we like, and mm -hmm. we, we take it from there. And uh, we like to give clear upfront fees to the client, and then run with that. So you know we're not one of these. Oh, it's only two hundred quid that you conveyancing, but here's a schedule of prices. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the optional extras that aren't exactly optional and then suddenly yeah. end up on your final bill that went from 200 to 700 yeah so no not for us yeah uh, and i suppose there. that's really important <laughs> helping sim in your line of work i suppose yeah it is absolutely and i suppose it's it's giving agents enough knowledge about what the solicitor does behind the scenes in conveyancing so they understand how important it is to use a solicitor that they trust and that they advise their agents accordingly. So let me start with a few of the, the questions that, um, that we've put together. So the first thing, sure. memorandum of sale, the first thing that you get mm. from an estate agent, a bit of a mixed bag, I would, I would suggest knowing, knowing agents and, and what yeah. does it matter? Some are good, some, are, some could be better. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the estate agents now have the same money laundering obligations we do, which means verifying the identity of the seller, and the buyer and then seeing where the funds have come from. Uh, more, quite common with a, with a lot of local agents. We still get memorandums of sales through with partial client names on, partial addresses, wrong addresses is, is another one. And bearing in mind, obviously we'll speak to our own client and get our own client's correct details. We won't necessarily get the other client's details until the other solicitor comes uh, and writes all this. So if we're preparing a contract off the back of a memorandum of sale and that memorandum of sale has like, you know, Bob Smith on it. I mean, you do get some children who are probably christened Bob, but they're probably few and far between. It's probably Robert. Yeah. Um, but it'd be nice if you could get full legal names at the get-go. You can get a contract, you can get it done, and it's right. You can go to the other side. Generally speaking, most contracts now are in standard form. You're literally just putting a name in it. So if you can shortcut just getting it right from the, the, the get-go, you, you're saving the solicitors a bit of time having to not go back and forth and uh, amend documents if they're right from day one. And I guess one of the uh, main other things. Aims, go on. So I'm guessing one of the go main on. aims in all the sales progression process, whether it's the solicitor or the estate agent, is to do it as quickly as possible, isn't it? You know, within the well, week quick, yes, yeah, so, and, yeah. and yeah, yeah and, and, and right, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's in no one's interest. I say this frequently. Right? It's not in my interest. It's not in your side's interest. It's in very few people's interests to, to 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 delay the sale. I mean, no one's got any. You know, we're not here trying to make the job any harder. It's it's a collaborative process, and. Uh, I mean, it's fair criticism of our profession the, that that 
that often solicitors will get involved in an argument when mm -hmm. there's nothing really to argue about. Effectively, they're just arguing over, you know, old rope. And it's just sometimes you think to yourself, are we just trying to score points here and look good in front of the client, or are we actually trying to get to the outcome the client wants, which is you yeah. know, to buy the house. And I guess that's part of the reason that from an agent and a solicitor point of view, if you can work with solicitors that you trust and that you all have the same agenda, that's going to be key. So tell me a bit more about the memorandum of sales. So the first thing, we, we need to make sure that the details are filled in. Sorry. And checking them against the, the ID is probably one of the best things for the, for the agent to do before yeah. they type it, I rather mean, than just it, pulling it, it from the it, it, it should be right. I mean, the other thing is just getting the other side's details correct as well. I mean, we moved offices three or four years ago now, and we still get memorandums of sales through, which have our old office address on. Mm -hmm. Now, solicitors uh, and estate agents and everyone should just be, uh, you can go onto the law site website, you can go on to the uh, Council of License Companies website, you can search for the offices for a particular firm and you can find their, their registered offices address and they, they should be the current address because that's where we check when we're trying to verify the other party. Now, if the other side doesn't, does, doesn't do that, sometimes you'll end up in the circumstances where documents go to, to an old address. Um, I mean, for us, it's, it's just around the corner, but there's still an inconvenience that obviously documents have somehow now ended up at the wrong place because mm -hmm. someone's used the wrong address. Um, the big issue that comes, obviously, is a lot of people using case management systems, including agents now. And once you put an address in, that's the address logged in. And I mean, I'll frequently go back to an agent and say, look, you've got our address wrong. Can you update your systems? They'll update the memorandum of sale. But lo and behold, two yeah. months later, another memorandum of sale comes out. And it's a local agent. You deal with them a lot. And it's got the, it's the old address one because they're yeah. still pulling through on the system. So it's simple things, there. isn't it? Looking at the future and thinking about the way the data applies in your CRM. And we're doing a lot of training about CRM systems as well. So that's a really good point that making sure that all your contacts and your suppliers are accurate in there. Hmm. So well, what I mean, about, if documents, what else? Oh, on. As I say, if documents aren't going out by email, hmm. then day one, they're going out to the wrong address, which invariably, yeah. you know, it goes there, not at the address, comes back to the office two weeks later. You're probably thinking, oh, I've sent the contracts, don't you do anything now? Buy a Scotland, they can just crack on with them. Next thing you know, Royal Mail returns it through your door. Two weeks, three weeks later, you've lost two or three weeks. So that's Sorry, a good but... question. So memorandum of sale, do they need to be posted or are you happy with them emailed? What, what's the best? What's the Email's norm? fine. I've got no objection to email as long as they, they definitely go to the right place. I yeah. think it uh, should be encouraged, to be honest with you, because... Sending one in the post. I mean, you've got the documents there in front of you. It's more than likely just the Word document, PDF. Send it by email. Save time. So worth, Why worth waste time. two, three days? Yeah. Best case scenario, yeah. email it and follow up with the with the written written contract with the written memorandum. Yeah. I, I mean, guess. Cli clients are keen as mustard at the moment. I mean, I've got documents waiting to go out. I'm just waiting for memorandums and sales. And granted, state yeah. agents are probably waiting for these solicitor details. But I mean, those documents are ready to. Mm -hmm send straight off as soon as as soon as I've got the sister's details. It's, it's, it's really straightforward for us. So what else do you want on the memorandum of sale? I know when we've put our course together. Well, I think that's it really. I mean, it's just it's, it's just getting the, the, the key information right from stage one. Have I got the right people's names and addresses? Have I got the right parties and representatives' names and addresses? I mean, it's sometimes helpful to have other things the parties are discussed on there. Putting on 28-day exchange, probably not as helpful as you might think, but we see it on every single memorandum of sale. <laughs> Having that conversation with a client, when are you looking to complete, if legal's are, if it's as soon as possible, maybe he's a note saying, look, the clients are fine to go whenever, or if they've got anything else, you know, they've got a related purchase. Sometimes it's helpful if you can just to get an idea of chain length. You know, have you got an onwards matter? What's the position with that? Put a note on there saying, oh, by the way, there's an onwards chain. It's, you know, currently only one matter, but there may be more depending on what gets firmed up there. But at least everyone has a rough idea and people can then manage expectations. Mm -hmm. I mean, particularly from a client perspective, it's the, it's, it's, it's the biggest problem. If a client says, I want to move as soon as possible, and the estate agent writes on the number of sale, buyer wants to move as soon as possible, but then the seller's actually got somewhere they need to then buy and they haven't even found somewhere yet. You've got a buyer who thinks, great, I'm going to move as soon as possible. And then you've got a seller on the other hand who thinks, well, I've told the agent I need to uh, find somewhere to buy and I haven't found somewhere yet. Yeah. So but it's and helpful just to have those discussions and maybe put it on, the sales memorandum. I mean, certainly there's stuff in our forms about it that go to the other side. But again, as if, if, if the parties are told at day one, they're not going to get annoyed and irate about it. Mm. Or, well, they probably will still get annoyed and irate about <laughs> it. But, uh, yeah. At least they can be told, I've, you, you, you were told this at the start. So I know it's not helpful, but at least you know, you know where you're coming from and you temper that a little bit. 
I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that it all ties into how well have you had the conversations as an agent with both the buyer and the seller at the point of negotiation as well in terms of time mm. scale and translating that onto the member memorandum is a great idea. What else on the memorandum do you tend to find? What else should the agents be looking out for to, to put on? I think that's largely all we use to be to, 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 to be quite honest yeah. with you. It's just, as I say, it's, it's getting those key details correct because yeah. That is a bigger stumbling block than you might think from a later perspective, just forgetting stuff out the door. If it's going out the door right, do it once, do it right, and it's done. There's yeah. no then messing about having to go back, redrafting documents or anything else. You're wasting your own time, the other side's time. Yeah. And, you know, I've had a contract in there. Um, I'd already sent the other side my client's full name, so they put it straight in the contract. Small typo on it, but I can just strike that through. Little one-liner, done. Yeah. Uh, and, and back out the door as a client. And what about things like if it's an auction sale? You, presumably, you need to know things like that. And, you know, expected times. Yeah, uh, but I mean, the auction auction will be slightly different. I mean, obviously, if it's a if it's a normal auction, you wouldn't get really a memorandum of sale. You just get the usually just a copy of the contract and uh, and the, the and the particulars on the front. Uh, yeah. I your client's buying this on this day. Come heaven. Uh, or yeah. I, uh, yeah, but the, but if it's modern auction with the sort of the reservation agreement, that would be helpful. I mean, uh, more often than not, you don't get the mem uh, reservation agreement, which uh, uh, would be helpful. Um, you sometimes just get a note saying it's fifty six day exchange. Yeah. But I mean, it would be helpful to actually see the reservation agreement. Uh, yeah. but, I mean, in fairness, I suppose all we need to know what is what it says. But <laughs> certainly from a from a from the perspective of advising clients, I mean, because you sometimes get clients who change their mind. Yeah. What are your rights and obligations, and then you've got to have the awkward conversation about getting a copy of that reservation agreement um, because you don't know what's going to come up, particularly on modern auctions. I mean, searches come in, you might find, oh, well, actually, there's issues here, which is probably why I end up in auction. Yeah. Here yeah. we are, changing your mind. Can I get out of this? Yeah. More often than that, you can't, and you're losing your reservation deposit, but it's a risky day. Yeah. And what about things, well, like, um, things being negotiated in the sale? How useful is that if they've decided that they want to leave the range cooker? Or do you tend to need to know? Well, we tend not even to, to be honest with you, it, it's hit and miss. I mean, at the end of the day, they're going to be putting together a fittings and contents that are standing away from the legal yeah. perspective. It's far better if that form's actually reflective of what's agreed to the agent. I think what the agent needs to be saying is for those sort of items is make sure you put them in the forms. Mm -hmm. the biggest problem we see is sale falls through, property goes back on the market, new buyer found, the old fittings and contents list comes over. Three weeks later, four weeks later, I've already sent it to my client. My client's already happy with it. Oh, sorry, by the way, there's some amendments to that form. So it's mm. like, well, actually, if, if, we'd had, if we turned our minds to it, I mean, certainly that's more criticism of the solicitor for not actually saying to the client, look, are these the same yeah. items you're leaving? Yeah. But mm. it's some sort of conversation the agent should be having is, well, we've agreed to leave these items. You can certainly leave a more note in the random the sale, but what the need is saying is, look, you need to make sure your forms that you send to your solicitor reflect this yeah. um, so that everyone's clear. But yeah, little things like that are agreed. What's not helpful is saying, oh, yes, we've agreed a 50 pound, 500 pound cash in and back payment that goes on the memorandum of sale. <laughs> Don't see that as much these days, but uh, Christ, <laughs> used to get that quite a few times. Oh, yes, buyer's going to do X, Y, Z. Solicitors will just have to write something into the contract and not worry about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. there's a mortgage. So. so, one of the things that, as well, I think we've talked about before is managing expectations. So, so mm. that's, that's the most important bit, I think, from, from the agent's point of view. And, and and who we communicate. What's the agent's responsibility in sales progression, I suppose, is what I want to get to the nitty gritty of. Well, I mean, for my view, sales progression should just go out the door. I feel it's a bit of a dinosaur of, a, of an all the time. I think what needs to happen, and whether it's not going to be a, something that changes for a long time, is clients speaking to their own solicitor. Yeah. And the other solicitors speaking to other solicitors. Um, I mean, I will chase local firms quite regularly, uh, certainly at least once a week, I'll be touching one of my files and making sure if something's getting nudged, if it, if it hasn't been for a while, and a bit more regularly, if it needs a bit more of a regular kick in the backside. But one of the, one of the, one of the big criticisms that uh, I, I would have is, is a state agent's trying to get involved and help that process, because what it actually sometimes does is leads to a Chinese whisper sort of situation. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather, if my client had an issue, my client speaks to me, Mm -hmm. and did all of the other because that client has an issue we speak to them i mean i got an updated email from the agent this morning uh the state agent uh, the, the seller's estate agent i should add not not, not my not my client i'm looking for the buyer uh oh um emailed my client copied me in oh your solicitor sent him an email yesterday asking what, um, what's going on and he hasn't replied 
my vendor wants an update. And my client's replied and said, well, I spoke to my solicitor yesterday and he's spoken to the solicitor and we're all waiting to hear back from the seller as to when she can move because everyone's ready. Mm -hmm. So rather than speak to the seller or, or ask the seller, can you maybe return your solicitor's call? Mm -hmm. We've got this roundabout thing where it's just like, well, I've spoken to this person. I've got, and it's like, sir, they're tattling tales and, and whatnot. When really, it's not where the loghead jam is. It, it's more the seller speaking to their sister and my client speaking to to, to, to me but it, it's a common source of delays where it's getting that communication going and there's no point uh, I mean it's helpful for the agent sometimes if people aren't responding that or if you've overlooked something but certainly there needs to be this encouragement of you know you need to speak to your sister and that doesn't mean to say you need to be chasing the sister because if the sister is facing a call from me the agent and the other side's client they're not getting the work done they're just fielding phone calls uh, and there's a certain point they actually need to sit on and get on and do the work. But uh, you'll often find that, you know, so, so, yes, there, there's sometimes a sticky wicket that needs to be to mm. worked loose, but more often than not, it's just a matter of getting the parties talking to each other. That seems yeah. is, is the biggest stumbling block. So your tip would be, I guess, at the beginning, whether it's your vendor or your buyer, that you say to them, look, the, the, to make this work and to make the sale move, you have to keep talking to your solicitor. Because I guess the solicitor will talk to the client, but they're less inclined to speak to agents. And I suppose the age-old problem the agents have is the solicitor never returns my call. But I suppose from the solicitor's point of view, the agent has no power. The client well, they don't. Um, I mean, one thing that agents forget is, well, we've got a duty confidentiality. Mm -hmm. We can't willy-nilly go and be discussing client business. Yeah. without having client consent uh, and I know some firms just take a blanket consent to take the estate mm -hmm. but I don't think that's appropriate because there are certain aspects of the transaction your client probably doesn't want the agent to know, yeah. uh, and I know, because it's not I know, a business. I know there's scenarios that you have to deal with that are quite complicated aren't they? if you've got a divorce going on there can be mm. all sorts of other ramifications behind the scenes that the agent may not be aware of so I guess talk me through that sort of thing is that quite common that you're having to sort of Fend the agent off because you've got to deal with something. Well, to be fair, if the, if there is something like that, the the the, the, the starting point is to speak to the client and then mm -hmm. saying, look, you need to have a word with your agent, uh, and then we need to have a word with your sister. I mean, I had a client say to me yesterday. She 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 rang up and said, I said, right, it's ready to go. When do you want to complete? September. I was like, well, that's we're in June now, so that's three months away. Mm -hmm. um, that's obviously quite a long period to go what's the reason because that's the first question i'm going to get asked when i when i go on the other side and as it turns out she's got um she she uh, her, her husband's funding her uh, uh creation for her brother and they just don't want to have a large cash out going before bank details and bank statements have to be provided because it may affect his visa application and they want to show obviously they've got money here if, he, if, if they need to support him but obviously they don't want to get into those ins and outs with the estate agent or anyone else but at the same time they don't want to be a certain look you've got to obviously say something to someone because yeah. sitting silence for three months is just yeah. going to end up with a property back on the market and everyone It'll go wrong, uh, yeah. annoyed yeah. Um, but you've got to have those discussions and it's no point burying your head in the sand. The worst thing people do is just put their head down and just ignore it and hope it will go away. When it's far better just to say, well, look, at, at the start, this, this is, you know, just so you know, I'll be looking to complete then. Yeah. Uh, and certainly what you should be trying to do is encourage an exchange in those circumstances. So at least the vendor's got some peace of mind that even if it has to be a later completion. Yeah. They can, they can at least exchange but it's about having those discussions and certainly yeah. it's the sort of thing I would expect to pick up the phone and speak to the other side about rather than just sending a one line email saying yeah. oh by the way completion September yeah and I guess a lot of this comes from the agent can be can be really good at gathering that information as early on as possible can't they you know what are you expecting um, you know what, what when what, are you expecting to move is, is it should be the first yeah. question really yeah. uh, and get, granted you're going to get clients who, who, who lie yeah. but they're just shooting themselves in the foot at that point yeah. so so i suppose it's educating the client as well to say you know we need to know what what your expectations are and i think if we've got the expectations right with the client at the beginning then we're a bit more open but i guess there are so many variables which we know about of things that can go wrong and things change but if we knew at the beginning what the expectations were without and manage those expectations say look we can't we as agents can't control the time scale because we can't and I think the public often think that we're in charge of that as agents. And I think that's the tricky bit, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is. But I think you kind of do that to yourselves by putting <laughs> yourself in that position and saying, look, if you've got questions, ask us. We're, we'll light a fire under the solicitors and whatnot. And, 
Yeah, sometimes it's helpful, but more yeah. often than not, it's just, you know, you're asking someone to chase someone when time would be better spent doing the work, as I say. Yeah, and that's, so that's the key point, isn't it? So sometimes the solicitors aren't getting back because they're being bombarded by calls that aren't productive. So I can see it from both sides, mm. actually, and I think the managing expectations bit is probably key and keeping the agent working with their vendor or buyer to put the pressure on the solicitor on both sides is going to be more effective than, than always chasing information. What, what about searches then? So one yeah. of the questions I was asked is, why don't solicitors do searches you know, until the mortgage offer is done? And, then, and, and, and that then feels like it could so, take... Well, I mean, sometimes clients, will, it will delay things, but I mean, a lot of clients will ask you that. A lot of mortgage brokers will encourage that. Mm -hmm. Don't put your searches in because at the end of the day, once you pay for them, that's that money gone. So a client pays us, we pay for the searches, mortgage offer gets declined, you know, you're 200 quid out of pocket. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's the risk you take, uh, yeah. effectively. I mean, we'll say to clients, look, I mean, it's up to you. It's your decision at the end of the day. Most clients are quite happy just to press on. But a lot of people will be like, well, actually, can I hold off on this? And I guess Which is, again... I can't and that's up to, the, that's up to the agent again, isn't it? To understand the vendor's expectations. So, therefore... You know, the vendor wants to go quick, therefore, Mr. Buyer, to protect yourself and protect your interests, it might be worth considering paying for your searches earlier on if you're comfortable that you're going to get your mortgage. So it's all about advice to your client, isn't it? Ultimately, this is this is the key, isn't it? So searches. It is, yeah. So searches, we know that we should be encouraging that early if the vendor or if the buyer are comfortable with that. Talk me through the mortgage offer process then. Because I think the, the estate agent's, uh, viewpoint is as soon as the mortgage offers in right we're off complete tomorrow you know so talk me through the why that isn't as quick yeah, as we yeah. <laughs> that, that that's a classic um i mean to be fair lenders are getting better so a lot of mortgage offers now are coming through digitally which is great you know it's, it's issued through a, a secure uh, portal so we can get our copy pretty much straight away which is extremely helpful but there's conditions and things in there that we then have to review. So the lender may have some additional requirements that are a bit unusual. There may be something in the lenders, uh, in the title deed that requires a response to the, uh, a referral to the lender. The lender does, most lenders, all lenders, in fact, uh, sign up to the CML handbook or the Building Societies Association. They provide standard instructions to solicitors, but a lot of those instructions are, if there's an issue here, tell us. And that then goes off to the lender's central fax number or email address. Fax Someone well, has a look at that. So, and fax. Uh, well, fax is better than post, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's time between things. I mean, you don't correspond directly with the person making a decision at the bank, mm -hmm. or it's rare that you do. There's some small lenders you might, but I mean, big banks, it's going in, it's going to a central inbox. It'll get picked up usually within a few hours. Someone will have a look at it, right? That needs to go off to the surveyor. Surveyor's not in-house, they're, they're, they're off-site, so that goes off to a surveyor, goes into a queue, they've got a turnaround time, that's going to be 48 to 72 hours. Then they respond, comes back to the bank, they've got a then turnaround time, produce a letter, back to the solicitors. There's a week gone, just yeah. on the mortgage offer coming through. And it's often simple little things as well. Clients getting a gift from mum and dad mm -hmm. have to be referred to the bank. I mean, the broker has probably already told the bank about it, mm -hmm. but and some banks are getting better and putting something in the office saying, just so you know, we're aware that mum and dad are putting in a gift of five grand. So if, if that's what your instructions are and you've seen what you see, we're fine, crack on. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of banks don't. It's just if the borrower is getting any money from anyone else, tell us. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you're waiting anywhere from, you know, 24 hours to, to, to a week for a reply. You've got to get the mortgage fee drawn up. That's got to go out. It's even more complicated. If I mean, I've got a client who she's selling through an online agent. A couple of months ago, the agent was like, oh, the mortgage office is in, buyer's ready. You know, we're four months down the line. We can finally set some completion dates. Clients on to me. Ask you the side. Oh, by the way, it's um, it's an irregular style of mortgage. The lender's got their own solicitors. We've got to pretty much go through the whole sale and purchase process with the lender's solicitor now. And you, you just roll your eyes and want to throw yourself off a bridge. But um, it's one of those things. But then you've got to say to the client, well, look, I'll tell you now, this is going to be another two months. And they don't believe you. And mm. we are where we are. Um, yeah. I'm not funny enough. I think it'll be two months now, actually. Yeah. Um, but it's just the someone's told the client mortgage offer in, they can go, and often it's not the case, particularly if there's yeah. some more complexities. But if it's still for a case, clients buying outright, mortgage offer in, yeah, crack on. Yeah, shouldn't yeah. be an issue. But yeah. there are things that go on in the background, and sometimes we do have to wait for apply. Because if we don't tell the bank, and the borrower defaults on the mortgage, and the bank takes possession. 
it's our insurance that comes into question. It's us who then has to put the bill for a problem because we didn't tell the bank something that might have an effect on their security. And I can guarantee you, there's no one's no solicitors, no law firm out there wants to take that risk. No, no one wants to be shelling out two hundred grand to a to a bank just to get something over the line. Yeah. Not even for the, the, the fees we get, uh, yes. or, it's very or, high or for anyone else's <laughs> So talking, well, of, talk, yeah. talking of insurance, then indemnities is a word that estate agents like, isn't it? Indemnity. Can we just do a dem? Can we indemnify that? Yeah. Talk me through that. For those who don't know what indemnity insurance is, talk me through that, or give me a couple of examples. So I mean, t t title insurance. What it is, it's a, it's a one-off policy that you can usually get off the shelf to cover a range of risks that come up com commonly in conveyancing. Sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not. Uh, but it'll always get suggested as an option via the estate agent. Can we indemnify against this? I mean, I had one um, a couple of weeks ago where the, there was a stray mortgage on the seller's title, which means someone else had a legal charge over it and a right to, to collect money and income and whatnot from the property. Uh, and the other side didn't have any details about it. They were struggling to find it was a probate sale. They were struggling to find account numbers to try and get in touch with the lender and see if it was money owed or if there wasn't why it was still on there because it was an older building society who'd been bought out of someone else. First thing we get from the, the state agent of the client is, can we indemnify it? No, because <laughs> it, it, it's a mortgage, but it, 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 it's a common thing. Um, building regs tends to be the other one for building regulations. So since 2005, all electrical and gas work requires building regulations. Most electricians, plumbers can self-certify. Um, so you'll have heard of NICEIC. That's the big one for electricians and gas safe. Or, uh, registered people, they'll, they'll go out, they'll, they'll check the work, they'll do a certificate, they'll file it in, and you'll get a nice entry on your search that says, you know, the, the, it was put in by a qualified person and they self-certified it complied with the relevant regulations. Sometimes, uh, tends to be more plumbers than anyone else, uh, you won't get those certificates because they haven't been lodged or, or, or paid for, probably, you tend to be one. So we'll often get requests for an indemnity policy for, for, for lack of building rights for a boiler. Now, when you're indemnifying, you're indemnifying against someone else. Oh, I've lost you. <laughs> I'll say for um, a Pikachu popped up. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Well, it'll be for work meetings, that's so I'll put something in there. Um, so you'll get indemnities for, for people ask you for indemnity policies for building regulations for a boiler. When you're indemnifying, you're protecting against someone else taking uh, action. So in the case of building regs, it's the local authority coming out and taking legal action against the property owner for uh, lack of building regulations. I have never in my years known a local authority knock on someone's door and ask to see the boiler. Okay, yes. Doesn't happen. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that's what you're indemnifying against. And that's not really helpful from a practical perspective. Mm -hmm. It's not really helpful because if you're a buyer and there's a new boiler gone in, say, last year and there's none of the usual certificates there, the better question would be, why not? Was the plumber not gas safe registered or did you just forget to do it? it tends to be the latter, but mm -hmm. often, you know, you, oh, yeah, by the way, my uncle just put it in. He used to be a plumber. Mm -hmm. Maybe it might be a good idea to get... Gotcha. A currently practicing plumber out just to have it checked over. That's probably a little bit better than paying for a fifteen pound indemnity policy, which is going to protect you against a knock on the door from the council. Yeah, which is no value. Yeah, absolutely. So it's about the it is. price. Yeah, absolutely. So what other indemnities? I mean, um, um, adopting on adopted roads on housing estates. Do you come across that quite a lot? Tends to be a big one. Yeah, we get asked that one a lot. Where there's the roads that yet to be taken over by the council. Uh, Newcastle Great Park up the road. I think yeah, you've been developing there, there yeah. for uh, live, live been there. De developing there for over a decade. Most of the roads aren't adopted. Uh, there are obligations in the various transfers for the for, for the developers to do it, but uh, the council have pretty much said, "Look, we'll get to it," um, as and when they stop developing. But we're still doing new properties on the estate, and I imagine quite a few other places are as well. So it's yeah. it's one of those things that's ongoing. The the risk being to to, to the client. Um, the builder goes insolvent and mm. the, the, the bill for upkeeping, uh, making the roads up effectively drops on their door. Yeah. It's probably a sensible thing to potentially indemnify against in the current climate, yeah. but it depends on, I mean, if you're talking, you know, your big builders, your, you know, your Persimmons, your Taylor Wimpy, mm. chances of them perhaps going insolvent, Minimal. probably yeah. a fairly minor risk. Yeah. Um, if it's a big enough estate, how much are you really talking? If, yeah. if the roads have already got the top surface on, are you talking just a bit of an admin fee? Yeah. It's probably not going to be huge sums of money. It's all risk, isn't it? I suppose you're always looking. It is risk. I mean, yeah. And as I said before, look, if, if, if you get it wrong, it's your insurance it stops on. Uh, so sometimes it's better just to ask the other side for a policy 
and put it on and crack on. And I will get, I mean, we get fairly regular requests for indemnities, but I mean, often I'll have to write back and say, look, the, the risky is negligible. I mean, oh, oh, there's some unknown covenants dating back to 1930 in respect of John Smith, who hasn't, uh, who says you can't uh, alter the property without getting his consent and you altered it five years ago. Mm. I mean, yeah. you're either having to track down John Smith, who's probably in the ground, or his successors, which good luck because you won't have any idea who, who, what land his successors still own in the area. Mm. The risk is often marginal, but there's a lot of people who are risk averse and would just rather just stick a policy in place. Yeah. I can't so, imagine they get claimed on a lot because the uh, premiums are peanuts. Yeah, um, right. yeah. But, so, yeah. so low risk in terms of taking one out, but low benefit as well in a lot of cases, isn't it, I guess? Yeah, yeah but it's, it can be peace of mind. But I mean, a lot of the time, some of them just aren't worth the paper they're printed on. I certainly wouldn't be asking for building regs for, for, yeah. for, for works a lot of the time. I'd rather just yeah. say... Get the, get you know, checked. oh, there's no building regs for the, yeah, get it checked. I mean, you, you know, you, more often than not, clients paying for a surveyor, ask them. Yeah. You know, there's an extension, there's no building regs. Did you have any concerns? So they'll be like, well, it was put up 15 years ago. I couldn't see any signs of movement or cracking. Yeah, just, just crack on, I'm fine. Yeah. But at least you've asked someone with the expertise yeah. rather than just getting a bit of paper that yeah. offers them no protection if it just tumbles down tomorrow. Yeah. So moving on from there then, so surveys and managing sort of survey, the reports coming back and problems. Do you get involved hmm. in that much and what sort of things are you... What, what, well, uh, the, the official line we're, we're, we're told to take with clients is if we've got concerns, it's time to do a full structural. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, you don't need a full structural on every single matter. And it's something the clients really need to just turn their mind to. But it's, it's a common source of delay. It's a common source of frustration for certainly the vendors when the buyer comes back for a second bite. I think one thing that the agents should be saying to, to certainly to sellers is look, bear in mind if, if there's a survey, there might be a, a bit of renegotiation, which is not uncommon. And people will probably sit grumble about it. Uh, people, well, I'm accepting this, but there has to be no, no further reduction. But I mean, flip it on the other side to the buyer's perspective. The buyer's not an expert in such matters. That's why they're paying someone else to come out and have a look. And it might be the surveyor goes out and says, well, look, there's 30 grand's worth of work here. Are you, are you really prepared to put the bill on this? But it's also worth having that discussion with the buyer. Look, have you thought about survey options? I, I imagine a lot of estate agents are terrified of it and just thinking, oh, best yeah. not rock that boat and we'll just leave it. But, yeah, but it's, a bit of Googling around, mm, sorry, one, no, savvy buyer's going to look at it. it. But it's often wise, actually, as an estate agent, that you do, you enter into it with your client with full knowledge and full information because a home buyer's or whatever the new version is going to be coming out mm. soon it's reasonably useful but I think a good agent is really good at getting the reports and working with the local contractors and really giving that information to the buyer um full structural as you say you know that it's, it's a rare kind of property that needs that in reality um but I think agents should be open to offering solutions for survey as well and it's a mindset well yeah I mean it's referrals as well isn't it at the end of the day yeah. and if you if obviously you're getting something from the surveyor for it then just yeah. do it at the early stage and get it out of the way yeah, absolutely. And particularly with, the problem with consumer protection law as well. You know, if we know there's likely to be a problem with a property, we need to be upfront with it as agents nowadays. So advising your vendor right at the beginning to maybe get certain reports about damp or roof checks or whatever, that is probably better in the long run from the set, keeping the sale together than putting your head in the sand at the beginning and then it falling through. Mm -hmm. because we should I mean, you'll often get a lot of damps, the classic. I mean, you'll often get someone who's quite willing to come out for free and give an estimate on it. Yeah, we can do that. It will be this. Yeah. thousand pounds right all right well what we'll do is we'll you know we'll meet you halfway on the work we'll we'll we'll, we'll knock the price down by 500 quid mm -hmm. yeah. job done job done. back on next thing yeah absolutely because in the scheme of things that's you know that's the most sensible option but the advantage there is, is time down the line because you're yeah. not then having to amend documents contracts uh get mortgage office flipped over because i'm sure mortgage brokers love having to rekey mortgage applications, especially if you're at the loan to value threshold and everything changes at that end. Yeah. It's just worth having that discussion at that point. Yeah. And maybe even doing a bit of the legwork then, then just having to come back to it in four weeks' time and then having another two or three weeks delay while it all gets moved yeah. around and sorted out. Yeah, yeah, good advice. So what about when it comes to exchange then? Why is there a reluctance, and you'll argue with me on this one, why is there a reluctance to exchange early and complete later? I think agents perceive that we want to keep Do it. exchanging completely. Exchange yeah. early, complete layer. Any <laughs> solicitors watching, exchange early, complete layer. <laughs> um, Christ, honestly. 
it, um, the amount of people who are just, it, it's risk management at the end of the day. It's, it's so, a lot of people are terrified of exchanging contracts because mortgage money doesn't turn up or you breach your contract. I mean, yes, it happens. Sometimes, you know, you will have a delay with the banking system and, you know, mortgage money may arrive a bit late. We've just come out of a lockdown there. I, I mean, personally, I've not known any instances of a lender failing to get money's over, but I've, I've heard stories of some solicitors having a couple of days delay getting their mortgage funds. It happens. Um, it's not the end of the world, you know, someone has to sit in their van, maybe, or get the van back out. But, I mean, far better to exchange contracts, get it locked in. Everyone's got the dates. Yeah. But the, the, the flip side of the coin is people want it done on short notice. I mean, the lender will say, right, we want five working days to give you the funds. And some the client will be like, well, can we complete in two days' time? Well, we can try, but we're going to have to try and get your funds. And I certainly wouldn't suggest you exchange contracts, commit to that date. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if the mortgage funds don't turn up, you're the one who breached your contract for the whole thing. So far better to give the lender the notice. But there's often this push, particularly towards month end and people looking for, uh, shall we say, their, 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 their oh, pipeline yeah. through for them. Yeah. yeah. So you'll often find things are done on short notice. And it, it's, it's risk at the end of the day. And it's a, a conversation client needs to have with the sister. But more often than that, yeah, if you can, exchange now as much time as you can between exchange and completion. Do it. Give people time to get mortgage funds, get settlement figures, yeah. get any outstanding stuff signed and done. Why rush around like a chicken with your head cut off? Yeah. Just get yeah. it done. Put it out of your mind. Christmas, absolute worst time of year for it. Yeah. Everyone wants to be through before Christmas. Short three weeks. Got to get the pipeline through. Mm-hmm. Got to get the money in through the books. Put it in for January. You'll find, you know, you, t- you try and tell clients, look, you're going to have a miserable Christmas. I know you want to be in your new house and you want to do it while you're off and all the rest of it, but you will have a miserable Christmas in your new house. I can promise you because you'll be in there, you'll, you'll have none of your sky or anything like that because they're not coming out to twitch or twitch or anything. <laughs> yeah. You're just going to sit there with a with, with, with your terrestrial TV oh, and gee. sat there bored to your mind. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to talk to your family. And it'll be an absolute nightmare. But put it, you know, exchange contracts for Christmas complete in January. You can then yeah. just take your break, enjoy it, and you've got peace of mind. And then the benefit. But yeah, the amount of people who just want to rush it. Go on, the benefit, sorry. Benefit of your last Christmas in your old home as well is another way of looking at it, isn't it? It's all well, perception. That's true. You know? It's all perception. That's true. And what about? So, yeah. um, so we've talked about exchange. Um, and what about the completion then? So talk me through kind of how long it takes the funds to go down the chain and why we as agents get you know, the buyers sitting outside with their removal van at nine o'clock in the morning and give us a hard time. It's, I mean, for, for, I've spoken to banks before and once the bank picks up the instruction and presses the button, it's in the other account. There's no time delay or anything like that. You're talking split seconds. It's just in from one account into the other. Mm-hmm. It's the bank doing that that takes the problem. The actual logistical step from the solicitor's point of view is so just to prepare the transfer forms, hand them into the accounts department or the cashiers who are doing it. They'll then log the, uh, I mean, back in the day, you'd fax it off to your bank, mm-hmm. but now it's you log it onto your electronic banking system. Mm-hmm. The bank then goes through its security checks on the transfer as well. So they'll have a look at it, make if it's new pay, you might want to speak to someone more senior and make sure that the account details are being verified. I mean, typically speaking, you're probably looking at about an hour between solicitors. Okay. That's on the basis of when the money's picked up, it's taken mm-hmm. straight to the cashiers, and then the cashier logs it and then puts it through. More often than not, you've got, you know, it's a Friday, you've got 20 completions, you're doing them in order. Mm-hmm. And you're one person at a desk or you're a team of people, and they're all going through to a, to a cashier or a team of cashiers, and it's just that little time moving from one person to the next person to the bank mm-hmm. before it then hits the other solicitors. Once it's the other solicitors, it's the same process. They're picking that up from their cashiers, which means they're relying on their cashiers, seeing it, getting the right references on it, mm-hmm. putting it on the right ledger, telling the fee owner it's in, uh, and moving on. I mean, from our perspective, we, uh, as a fee owner, we have access to the, to the account live, so we can see the money's coming into the client account. So it's a bit easier from our perspective to see mm-hmm. money's coming in and out. But you, often, yes, you are just people sat in vans, and because you're waiting for someone to yeah. press buttons, yeah, and that's all it is. So um, what, what day of the week's best to complete then? Any day, mm. but stop doing it every Friday. <laughs> Mondays are a bloody nightmare, but um, that's that's by the by. Mondays you'll see a lot of right to buys because people pay the uh, the rent of the council uh, for the week. Mm-hmm. So the ca- every local authority wants to complete on a Monday for right to buy. So generally speaking, throughout the week, fine. Mm-hmm. Try and avoid Fridays. Try and avoid towards the month end. But everyone thinks okay. it's a Friday. I get the weekend to move in. But I mean, there's a lot of people who aren't doing nine to five Monday to Friday yeah, and a working Saturday really, to Sunday. Yeah. We're just in a, habit. we're in a yeah. habit to agree to, to a degree, it, it, I think. Absolutely. But I mean, it doesn't have to be a Friday. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, you tell a client any 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 week, and they ask you, then can we do it on a Sunday? And you say, say yeah. and sigh loudly. Um, oh, but yeah, you do get it. <laughs> but um, um, so yeah, uh, I had uh, two on Monday, one on Tuesday, two yesterday. I've got none this Friday, which is great. Yeah. Uh, next Friday is going to be manic because it's my bend. But I mean, you. W- whatever you can really but there's no there's no hard and fast rule uh, certainly you'll see things moving quicker on days that aren't end of the month that yeah. aren't fridays because there's less people yeah. t- people's time spread between doing multiple transfers or working on multiple files but if you spread them out over the week yeah. far better for it yeah. sometimes it's worth having a conversation with the solicitor how busy are you that day how yeah. busy is your department um, a good tip absolutely very much so because most people will take a day off to move house, weren't they? You know, and actually giving us moving on a Thursday and having the Friday off to sort is nice, isn't it? You know, so it's all about that. Mm. It's all about how we advise. And I think the estate agent's role is very much to manage expectations and offer the best possible advice and give them decisions to make and choice. And understanding a bit more mm. about what happens behind the scenes is, is is key. So, what do you think makes a good agent in sales progression? Then, what what would what do you want from an agent in sales progression? And I Stop calling like, me. <laughs> You can't have that. <laughs> don't. Well, no, but I mean, uh, a, a lot of the time, speak to my clients. I mean, we're pretty good at keeping our clients up to date. Uh, uh, an example I gave you earlier, where, where they used to chase me and then had their response and then chased again, copy the client in. Uh, and the client said, well, look, here's where it is. If you just asked, or if you'd asked your own seller, you'd know where it was. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, as I said, it's got to come back to inc- the, the four people who can move a transaction forward. Uh, it's not a suspect to agent, but the seller, seller solicitor, the buyer, and the buyer solicitor. Mm-hmm. Those are the four people who need to be talking to each other. Uh, and that's what needs to be encouraged because that's the only way it's going to get over the line is getting the solicitors to, to, mm-hmm. to, to communicate. And sometimes they're waiting on third parties and there's not much can, can be done about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but more often than that, it's, it's just communication at the end of the day. So a good agent should be encouraging. You know, And I don't mean encourage the client oh you need to be on your system make sure you ring them every day and know what's going on i mean uh we say to clients i frequently say to clients look don't ask me for an update every day mm. i've gone back to decide yeah. i can tell you now they'll have turnaround times and it will be at least two or three days and in the middle of the current lockdown it's probably even longer so yeah. look just bear that in mind i'll let you know when i hear anything but if not i'll follow up say next week the latest yeah. but it's about encouraging that discussion yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, between because uh, time out my day speaking to estate agents is just uh, is, is just a waste of my time. I would much rather tell my client what's going on because then they're not ringing up me up saying, "Well, I've just heard this from the estate agent." That's mm-hmm. two phone calls of people. I'm just repeating the same thing, mm-hmm. and then sometimes you get the wife coming on. My husband's just been told this by the estate agent. You've just told this to him, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a and that's three it? calls you've had. Yeah. Yeah. It is a little bit, and I, I know from your perspective. You, you, you want things moving but sometimes it's it's just eating time out of there and mm-hmm. there's, there's only so much you can do in in mm-hmm. in, in, in a given yes, a lot of it i frequently so i'm just thinking I, i'm wondering so, if a lot of it is because the estate agent doesn't understand the time scales within the process and maybe there's a lack of lack of knowledge and i know from my perspective when i did sales progression i did it because i was told to do it on a weekly basis but i didn't really understand what the transaction meant behind the scenes. And I think some staff who work with sales progression every day will be very knowledgeable. Those negotiators who are quite new to the industry will find it tougher to understand what to do, I guess. Hmm. Then- um, I mean, yeah, the big thing is, is, is time scales. I mean, I'll frequently get, um, have you issued contracts on this? I mean, client hasn't even returned any paperwork to me yet. A simple phone call to the client would have yeah. said, have you had the stuff from your sister? Have you sent it back? What's, yeah. what's happening? Yeah. rather than i'll ask the solicitor who will just turn around and say no the yeah. starting point really speak, speak, point. To, speak to your own client yeah. um and certainly with, with, with selling agents as well they should mm. be speaking to the seller because mm. yeah sorry no oh. sorry, I'm, I'm sorry i'm interrupting but i'm just thinking so really as agents we should be advising the client whether it's the seller to say have you returned your id have you signed a contract with your solicitor have you done have you paid for your searches are you happy to do those early and have you filled your fixes and fittings in? Because I know what I'm like. When I did a remortgage, the big, yeah. huge emailed bump came from my solicitor. And then I had a load of stuff dropped through my, do- my door. And I went, ah, and put it to one side because it was too much to deal with. My husband, on the other hand, is an auditor. And he would happily have gone through that and got it off, off his desk. Out. You know, so it's understanding your client. No, it's fine. 
and it's it, it is an intimidating a lot of paperwork and i think clients need to be told that i mean we've started tra- recently issuing a lot more stuff electronically and we'll still get clients uh, who want to have a pen and paper and just sit and go through it at their own pace and that's going to take them time it'll be like right i'm working monday to friday mm-hmm. so i'll do this after tea when i've got the kids down so maybe get an hour a night in and it's just mm-hmm. Time to and ID as well is, is a tricky one. Often you'll have to go and see the solicitor or see someone local to have your ID verified. Mm-hmm. That can be a tricky one because you know, time out your day, time out of work. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's about having those uh, discussions. I mean, certainly there, if you've got like a, uh, for, from our perspective, if you've got a regulated mortgage advisor in house mm-hmm. who can take the ID and can certify it, that's a big time saver for us because you've got a regulated person who, who's seen the ID. And if we can then get copies of that. We, we know someone else has seen the client as well, which, which helps us for our own due diligence uh, yeah, and do the side of things. Mm. But I mean, you know, you can't just have anyone just rubber stamping ID, otherwise I think it uh, yeah. <laughs> be anyone that's really. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Any other tips on sales progression? Because I think that was, that's been really useful. Um, as I said, it's, it's, it's mostly got to be communication, but only, working down a tick box list is not helpful. Have they done searches? Have they raised inquiries? Have the inquiries been responded to? Mm-hmm. Not every transaction runs in that straight form. Mm-hmm. It, it, it can, I had a transaction where we got a nice complete pack of, uh, of documents from the seller's solicitor. It was probate sales, so the seller has very little knowledge. There wasn't much to waste by way of queries. In fact, there's nothing because the seller didn't know anything about the property. Mm-hmm. So getting the searches in, State agent rings up for an update. Um, they're told by the, I, I, I've already told the solicitors that we've got no queries in the paperwork. So you tick a box saying so, solicitors queries answered. We send that to my client. My client's in touch. Oh, what queries did you raise? What 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 were you about? And perhaps I should have said to my client, look, I've got no issues with this. And in fact, I did at that time there, but that was time out my day than having to go to the client. So mm-hmm. well, actually, here's where we're at. And the client's wondering, why aren't you raising questions about this? It's just like, well, there's nothing here. There's nothing. There's nothing. To, to ask about everything's quite straightforward there's nothing you need to worry about but it was, it was just that panic and sometimes it's just working down a checklist isn't necessarily helpful in all circumstances yeah there, there are certain milestones that should be hit and the key ones i think are going to be mortgage offer and, and searches but certainly things like inquiries there's no hard and fast rule you'll often get a second round third round mm-hmm. fourth round of inquiries i mean christ i had uh, 15 rounds with one, with, with, with one firm recently i could have strangled them um oh, give, me some when you're... give me some examples of inquiries just for those negotiators who perhaps haven't dealt with the purchase or sale themselves well um i mean we've been discouraged by our by our professional body the last site we've stopped raising standard questions but we'll still get questions please confirm that the seller's seen the covenants on the title and has observed and performed them and you look at the covenants and there'll be things along the lines of not to be a nuisance to your neighbors there's already standard questions in the form as to whether you've, you know, you, you've had notices or complaints about your conduct of property. Uh, not to use the property as a, as a, as a slaughterhouse is, is, is another <laughs> classic or, or as a pub or somewhere for a license to trade over here. And it's, it's common sense stuff. And you look at it and you'll think, actually, no, this is a residential house. Of course they comply with the covenants. It's, 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 it's a waste of time asking this question. Yeah. But you'll still get those pre-printed questions through or questions that are already answered in the standard forms it, 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 it's a huge bugbear for us just uh, uh, this morning i had 20 19 questions from another firm mm-hmm. on a matter i think i had to ask my client three questions because the rest of the, the stuff was literally just referring them back to the standard forms mm-hmm. and, and it's a, a huge waste of time but you, and you'll, you'll often find that most issues can be drilled down to four or five points uh, 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 that are actually you know issues that someone wants to look at and yeah. um, things like planning consents and building regulations for, for, for works that's being done and that's perhaps something the estate agent can turn clients minds to oh i see you've had a recent extension have you got any documents for that yeah. make sure you get them to the solicitor mm-hmm. solicitors are meant to check when they get the forms back from the clients, we do. Um, and ask the clients, look, you've had these works done, we're never to be going to get asked for the documents. Do you have copies? If not, might be an idea now to get in touch with the council uh, and get some duplicates sorted because we're going to get asked for them. Save mm-hmm. us two weeks and we'll have no order them down the line. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you know, if an exception went up in the in the 50s, it would give some monkeys. Yeah. But if it was like a, a year ago, it, it's worth yeah. turning people's mind to getting documents yeah. at the forefront and up and speeding up the process yeah. um, and i mentioned getting that. documents back 
Funnily enough, we on, talk sorry. about that. We talk about that in our lister training. That actually, as the person going out to put the house on the market, as a lister, that makes you stand out because you're saying, "Well, have you got your building reg certificates? Have you got your planning permission?" You know, if you ask that right at the beginning of the transaction, you stand out as a property professional, not it all being last minute further down the line. So I think that that goes goes to hand in hand with good agency anyway. Actually, well, and uh, just. <sighs> We'll come back to an earlier point now, actually, but the sales memorandum, free or resold, making sure the seller knows yeah. what the title is and if they don't know, saying as such, the amount of people who find, get, you know, a couple of weeks into the conveyancing process. Oh, God forbid, I've had some sellers, uh, so, some buyers who've come back to me eight weeks on to the matter and said, we didn't know the property was leasehold. It's just like, well, hang on. Mm. How have we got to this point? Because, I mean, certainly we've sent the documents out to your solicitor from day one and it, with the lease and it's quite clearly leasehold. And you've obviously not had this discussion. But I mean, it's about putting people's mind to it and asking clients. Yeah. I mean, you, you're probably familiar with Tyneside Flats locally. Yeah. So uh, a fairly manageable management. scheme. Yeah. I had a client recently who was told by an agent to Tyneside Flat, don't worry about it. It's not a Tyneside Flat as it happens, which is a 999 year lease with no ground rent. It was an old local authority lease, which means the council still manager. It's, it was only a 90 year lease which isn't the worst thing in the world, but obviously it's a lot more than 999, which is one pause. There is a ground rent, it's only a tenner, but again, not the end of the world. But then the service charges, which is things you're not prepared for, or not aware of, and with the local authority, they don't keep any sinking funds or the like, so what it means is when there's a new roof needed, you're putting a 30 grand outlay out, um, which you're having with the other property. It, 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 immediately, my, my clients are week into the process, we've been through the paperwork with her, and she's now out of pocket, because we've done quite a bit of work running her through these things. Mm. But we had that discussion with her, do you know about the lease? Oh, it's a time so I've let the agent's head. The first mm. discussion I was like, before I go into this paperwork, I don't need you to appreciate this isn't a time so I've let. And here's the lease arrangement. And I've got a brief look at it, but I don't want to obviously do your searches, run up a bill of costs here yeah. if this is a showstopper. And as it was, it was a showstopper. Um, but, you know, the vendors lost the potential, well, has lost the buyer there. Um, and it's purely because things were misrepresented to get to. Yeah. Now, estate agents can't be expected to know the difference between a time like that and a normal lease, but they need to be at least having the discussion as, is it lease or? Because you know, sometimes people just don't think about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. New estates as well, maintenance fees. Yeah. A lot of people are surprised when they get told about those. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a 200 quid a year to, to XYZ management company. People weren't told about this. Yeah. Um, it, it, but it's, again, it's, it's, it's having that discussion. Do you have any, is there any charges you pay to someone else? Like, yeah. particularly on new states, yeah. they're all uh, uh, maintained these days. Uh, and a lot of this links actually to the sort of content we put together in terms of consumer protection regulations, because our, our obligation in estate agents is to make sure that the buyer has enough information about the property before they commit and knowing whether there's excessive maintenance charges or a short lease is is material information that would affect whether they make a decision or not so we as agents should be professional at the beginning with that sort of information absolutely and we very much champion that as able agent that people understand what they ought to be doing because then it stops problems further down the line you know benefit for everyone yeah I mean, the other thing is saying, oh, it's lethal, don't worry about that, is, is, yeah. is a classic one. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of house. But I mean, in the current climate, people are terrified of it. Yeah. Just be one quick Google and all you see is horror stories. Yeah. And it turns out it's a £2 a year ground rent and 999 year lease. So who Fine, cares? crack on, who yeah. cares? But um, if you're not having that discussion, people mm -hmm. are just going to go away and start Googling lethal problems. Mm -hmm. And you hear about, oh, these managing agents, they can just charge what they want. Uh, and some of them can, and there are a lot of unscrupulous uh, landlords out there, and perhaps they will get regulated one day once we get through Brexit and once we get through lockdown, and mm -hmm. once the government sets an agenda because they've put it on their agenda. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But I mean, the leasehold reform is a, is, a, is a big area because there are a lot of tenants who heal over, and you only see the, the worst stories that hit the press. And because there are so many, you know, unscrupulous landlords who've taken mm -hmm. taken the taken the nick over the years. Uh, yeah, so right. and agents need to understand all of this, don't they? And, that, and that's part of the expertise of knowing their marketplace. Anyone selling where I live, Great Park, will know the problems of Great Park. Unadopted roads, you know, ground rent maintenance charges on, you know, on, on people with detached houses. It doesn't just apply to blocks of flats, does it? So these well, it's, it's the other thing for encouraging a local agent as well. It's knowing these local areas. Yeah. You deal with someone online like a loper or whoever, they're not going to know about these sort of uh, things at the Great Park or yeah. and some of these local firms as well. I mean, the Great Park, I mean, I'm dealing with the sale at the moment and the other side asked about the adoption of the roads. 
mm-hmm. every solicitor around here knows that those roads aren't being adopted no, anytime never. soon. <laughs> well, not anytime. Well, they will. Well, we should at some point, but uh, mm-hmm. not until they stop developing. But you're still going to get questions about it. So having that knowledge, do a lot of work in Sheffield. Mm-hmm. All leasehold. There's mm-hmm. very few free old properties in Sheffield. Sheffield. Lots of leasehold houses, old 800-year leases. Mm-hmm. Um, never 999 or, or, mm-hmm. or 200 tend to do the one as well. But just, Sheffield just picks random figures up and you uh, uh, for <laughs> leases. But, uh, but you'll see quirky little things up and down. I mean, we do national work and start learning all these mm-hmm. little areas where you have these sort of quirky things that are a little bit different. I mean, a leasehold property up here is quite uncommon unless it's flat. Or it's a it's a new build where someone's taken the mick recently, and uh, uh, one of the builders has had a, a as a goal, but the builders have all been hauled about that. that. <laughs> but I mean, certainly in certain parts of the country, leaseholds quite a common uh, standard tenure for for houses. And you've got to be a fair set of client. This is common for your area, yeah. and understanding that. And it's the same with agents, it's about understanding that this is your market, and mm-hmm. this is common for your market, as it were. And you're right with the Great Park as well. It's about having that discussion. Just mm-hmm. so you know, there's maintenance charges. Mm-hmm. Um, although some properties don't pay, uh, and I'm sure that's a bug bear on the Greater Park Facebook group. Yeah. Um, but not a bill yet, but anyway, that's a story. <laughs> brilliant. Uh, that's the other one as well. Yeah, brilliant. No, that's um, that's been really, really helpful. So uh, I'll just say thank you to you now, and I'll I'll stop our recording so that uh, the guys on the video don't have to hear us gossiping afterwards. But uh, thank you very much. I shall uh, appreciate that time. Thank you.